I'd like to call this meeting to order. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the final meeting of the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Natural Resources for the 2021 to 2022 interim. Uh, before we begin, as uh, I have done in the past, I'd just like to note that uh, we have members joining this meeting from the ancestral homelands of the the Nuwu, the Nui, and uh, Numu and Washoe peoples, and. Uh, I appreciate uh, all of the uh, participation and engagement and collaboration that we have had with um, uh, with indigenous and, and uh, tribal uh, representatives throughout this committee process. Uh, today, uh, we have a work session on our agenda. Uh, members who are joining us virtually, please be sure to keep your video on so that we uh, can maintain a quorum and conduct our, our votes and be sure to mute your microphone when you're not speaking to keep background noise down. Um, with that, will the staff please call the roll? Senator Goy Kachio. Here. Assemblyman Ellison. Here. Senator Donate. Here. Assemblywoman Hansen. Here. Senator Dondero Loop. Here. Assemblywoman Carlton. Here. And Assemblywoman Bilbray Axelrod. Here. And Chair Watts. And I am here. Thank you. We have all members present, including our alternates. Thank you for serving today. Uh, with that, I'll make a couple of quick housekeeping announcements before we move forward. Uh, we will have two opportunities for public comment at this meeting, once at the beginning and once at the end. Uh, members of the public may provide testimony in writing, in person, uh, and also by phone. Uh, to call in, uh, dial 669-900-6833. When prompted to provide meeting ID, please enter 820-6807-6386 and press pound and our broadcast and production services staff uh, will indicate when it's your turn to speak. We ask that all comment be limited to three minutes. Uh, and with that, we'll begin our first public comment period for the day. Um, so I see we have some folks coming up to the table. We'll begin here in Las Vegas, then we'll go up to Carson City, then we'll go to the phones. Whenever you're ready, go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, please state and spell your name for the record, and you can begin. Thank you, Chair Watts and members of the committee. My name is Jane Amon, J-A-I-N-A-M-O-A-N, and I'm the External Affairs Director for the Nature Conservancy in Nevada. The Nature Conservancy supports recommendations 2, 6, 8, 9, and 10 on the work session document. We have provided a written comment to the committee that offers our rationale for support and additional information to consider. In particular, with this public comment, we would like to further explain what start from the start, smart from the start energy planning means. We are about to experience a massive build out of renewable energy and climate infrastructure in Nevada. We are very concerned that the deployment of this infrastructure, if done hastily and on a project by project basis, as is happening now, could have disastrous effects on our wildlife, open spaces, cultural and historic places, and outdoor recreation opportunities. However, science from the Nature Conservancy has shown that it is possible with careful planning to build out the clean energy and climate infrastructure we need while conserving our natural and working land. In Nevada, we can do this with smart from the start planning. A smart from the start plan for renewable energy identifies where renewable energy generation, transmission, and storage can de be deployed with as little impact as possible to natural lands, cultural resources, recreation, and other conservation values. Achieving a smart from the start plan will require coordination among local, state, and federal governments. Recognizing that most of Nevada's land is managed by the Bureau of Land Management, the Nature Conservancy recently sent a letter to BLM Nevada State Office offering a recommendation for an energy siting and transmission infrastructure plan that would direct and streamline permitting for responsible development of renewable energy and transmission wide. 
We have enclosed the letter with our comment to the committee. In addition to a position statement on start from the start energy planning, we ask that the committee consider drafting a letter to the U.S. Department of Interior expressing the urgent need for energy planning in Nevada. The state of Nevada has previously recognized the importance of smart from the start approach. In 2020, the Nevada climate strategy highlighted the need for smart from the start planning in the complex challenges section of its strategy. And in 2021, the state land use planning and advisory council issued a letter of endorsement for the smart from the start planning concept. Smart from the start planning also considers already disturbed lands and existing linear corridor disturbance as opportunities for energy development. These could be mine lands, brownfields, old industrial spaces, urban parking lots and commercial rooftops, or checkerboard public lands that have already been taken over by cheat grass. Building on these lands and spaces can help us meet our energy needs and at the same time help avoid conversion of natural habitat. Briefly regarding item 10, the Nature Conservancy offered detailed recommendations for su the support for these items in the June 24, 2022 letter of recommendation for how the state can support the division of water resources. In our water limited state, it is critical that the agency oversees water in the state and has the resources needed to make science-based decisions to ensure that there is water to support people, plants, and wildlife for future generations. Thank you so much for the opportunity to comment and for your service on this committee. And thank you for considering our support for recommendations two, six, eight, nine, and 10 on the agenda. Thank you very much for your comments. Mr. Lister, welcome back. Whenever you're ready, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Bevan Lister for the record. And, and I'll just speak briefly. Uh, as I did earlier in the earlier meeting on your uh, you're going to be looking at uh, possible changes to Nevada water law and definitions and those kind of things and and uh, as a water right owner and user the uh, the concepts that are being pr brought forward <sighs> will lead to tremendous uncertainty and and loss for those especially those that are priority right holders um, the combination of basins as well as this undefined whatever conjunctive management might turn out to be in someone's mind um, do nothing other than to diminish what Nevada water law has always been. Nevada water law has always been the simplest, most straightforward, and strongest water law in the country. We support the prior, or I support the prior appropriation doctrine, and and I, I whatever advocacy by the agencies to add more tools to the toolbox is a false narrative in my mind, because they're not willing to use the tools that they have, which are the most powerful tools anywhere in the country. So with that in mind, I, I would urge you to be very cautious of 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 what types of changes and the possible implications of those changes to Nevada water law and look forward to uh, make myself available to you as as a resource or, or look forward to working with you throughout the session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to provide public comment in Las Vegas? Seeing none, do we have anyone wishing to provide public comment in Carson City? Yes. Thank you, Senator. Whenever you're ready, you can uh, state your name and spell it for the record and begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, I'm Doug Busselman. I'm the Executive Vice President of Nevada Farm Bureau. As this committee goes through your work document and covers specifically the recommendations coming to you from the Public Land Subcommittee, we want to focus our comments on the bill draft proposal dealing with the process and authority for water conjunctive management. In anticipation that your joint committee will further advance the concept of the framework for implementation of conjunctive management by the state engineer, I want to identify for your awareness Nevada Farm Bureau's priority interest in this legislation. I would like to encourage your consideration of opportunities as well as a process for developing this legislation by bringing as broad a range of stakeholders together as possible. 
we also are strongly in support of incorporating water right owners in the local water basins in the actual implementation process for conjunctive management. This pillar of engaging water right owners in the procedure for conjunctive management is essential. Top-down edicts without local engagement of those being affected is not acceptable. Our organization's perspective on conjunctive management while supporting the use of sound science also believe that the process needs to be based on site-specific circumstances. This critical element is another foundation principle which needs to be incorporated into the legislative proposal. Combining groundwater and surface water into conjunctive management practices will be complicated. Sorting through established water rights based on separate sections of Nevada law is not going to be easy. We look forward to working with the legislators the Division of Water Resources and other state stakeholders in developing a workable structure for dealing with conjunctive management. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much, Mr. Bussman, for your remarks. Anyone else? Yes, I believe so. Yes, I believe so. Thank you. Chairman Watts, this is Kyle Rohrink, Executive Director of the Great Basin Water Network, K-Y-L-E-R-O-E-R-I-N-K. I uh, don't want to belabor uh, uh, some of the points that have already been made about the legislation that will be coming, um, that was, will be sent to you all from the, uh, the Interim Public Lands Committee, but this is going to be a very difficult conversation as it relates to conjunctive management. I think uh, there is going to be a need for a very inclusive discussion from a lot of different stakeholders. And I think, you know, the one point that we just want to make right now is uh, largely deals with uh, issues of, of mitigation. We don't want to uh, really ever see language where you're forcing uh, mitigation on someone, especially if, um, you know, you're uh, granting new appropriations. And uh, we look forward to uh, uh, discussions with, uh, with the state lawmakers and uh, other groups and, and interests. And, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to comment. Thank you, Mr. Rohrink. Is there anyone else wishing to provide uh, public comment in Carson City? Yes. Welcome, um, whenever you're ready. Clifford Banuelos. Um, I'm the Tribal State Liaison for the Intertribal Council of Nevada. And uh, this is regarding item G11. A request for drafting of a bill to adjust state agency employment standards to help um, tribal employees obtain state employment uh, with some additional language. Uh, ITCN supports any bill that enhances the responsibility uh, for the state to work with tribes. We do have some uh, concerns. Uh, we want to make sure that language is in the bill, if, if such a bill is written, that um, is, is uh, notated or, or put into the state tribal consultation policy as mandated by AB 264. And then we want to make sure that it's fully investigated any uh, conflicts on current state statutes that restrict hiring for Native American preference. And then um, we, uh, we understand the importance of getting people with experience um, or, or having being members of Native American tribes or descendants of Native American tribes. But we think it's also important that experience is put into place or put, put in there, that they've worked for Native American tribes in a managerial role that required technical expertise. Uh, too often we see uh, Native Americans hired that may not be qualified because they want to um, reach that goal of hiring Native American to work as a liaison. So we want to make sure that there's language in there that we are hiring um, qualified personnel that has experience working for Native American tribes. And thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Benuelos, and thank you for your service on the Subcommittee on Public Lands. We appreciate it. Anyone else wishing to provide public comment? I don't see anyone else coming forward, Mr. Mr. Chair. Chair. Thank you very much for that assistance, Senator Koikachia. With that, we will move on to see if we have anyone wishing to provide public comment remotely, broadcast production services. Can we see if we have anyone? And if so, get them in the queue. To participate in public comment, please press star nine to take your place in the queue.
Caller, you are unmuted and may begin. Good morning, Chairman Watts and esteemed committee members. For the record, my name is Carl Urquiaga, C-A-R-L-E-R-Q-U-I-A-G-A. I am a lifelong Nevadan and Nevada field representative for the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. I would like to ask this committee to support the bill request in today's workshop under item B, wildlife conservation, requesting the drafting of a bill to establish a fund, establish and fund an account with the purpose to identify, construct, and maintain wildlife crossings. Right now, as a result of Congress passing the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, there's an unprecedented $350 million in federal grants available to states as a pilot program for wildlife-friendly infrastructure, such as safe highway crossings. To qualify this program, states are required to have a certain amount of matching funds. This is the reason why the organizations listed on this agenda item have worked with Chairman Watts to request this bill. Obviously, this fund will need seed money. This account could also be used as a repository for grants and donations from other sources as well. Several other Western states have recently created and funded similar accounts. Oregon, Colorado, New Mexico, and Utah recently approved $7 million, $5 million, $2 million, and $1 million respectively for this purpose in those states. Additionally, our groups requested the consideration of another need that is not specifically included in today's workshop. Last August, Governor Sisolak signed Executive Order 2021-18, calling for the Nevada Department of Wildlife to develop a habitat, the Nevada Habitat Conservation Framework, Sagebrush Habitat Plan, and Wildlife ha Habitat, excuse me, Wildlife Connectivity Plan. The order aims to reverse the long-term trend of loss of Nevada's wild landscapes, which has suffered from climate change, wildfire, invasive species, and habitat fragmentation. The creation and full implementation of this order will require additional staff capacity. We would like to ask that this committee consider, either today or at a future workshop, legislation allowing Nevada Department of Wildlife to recruit and hire up to three new full-time staff positions to fill this need. Your support in this request, these requests is greatly appreciated. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your comments. BBS, we can move on to the next caller. Thank you, Chair Watts and members of the committee. My name is Christy Cabrera, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-C-A-B-R-E-R-A. -E I'm the Policy and Advocacy Director for the Nevada Conservation League, and I'm also here in support of work session item two um, that requests the drafting of a bill to establish and fund an account for wildlife crossings. Roads and highways that intersect wildlife habitat create safety hazards for both wildlife and drivers. In the United States, between one and two million animals are hit by vehicles every year. This results in around 30,000 human injuries, 200 deaths, and an annual cost of about $8 billion in taxpayer money. Because wildlife often crosses roads and highways in specific spots year after year, targeted investments in wildlife crossings can go a long way. A recent study by the Nevada Department of Transportation found that overpass and underpass structures paired with fencing can reduce wildlife vehicle collisions by 80 to 100 percent while also providing criti critical habitat connectivity. When we put these structures along historic migration corridors, we're not only saving wildlife lives, we're also saving human lives and money. By establishing and funding an account to construct new and maintain existing wildlife crossings, we can save wildlife lives, save human lives, and save Nevada money. We strongly encourage you to accept this recommendation. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you for your remarks, Ms. Cabrera. Uh, with that, BPS, can we move on to the next caller? Chair, the public line is open and working, but nobody else wishes to participate at this time. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll move on to the next item on our agenda, which is approval for the minutes of the March 21st meeting. Uh, all members should have received uh, the draft minutes. So with that, I'll ask if anybody has any uh, comments or revisions about those minutes. Seeing none, I would uh, take a motion to approve those minutes. So moved. I have a motion from uh, Assemblywoman Carlton. Do I have a second? I've got a second from uh, Senator Dondero Loop. Any discussion on the motion? 
Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye or raising your hand. Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, any opposed? Nay. Any abstentions? Okay, we've got an abstention from Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod. Uh, with that, the motion passes. Uh, with that, we'll now begin uh, the, the main event on our agenda today, which is our work session. Uh, members, the work session document uh, is posted to the subcommittee's meeting page, and it contains a list of proposed recommendations related to public lands, wildlife conservation, outdoor recreation, natural resource agencies, excessive heat mitigation, environmental justice, and tribal issues. Uh, Mr. Stinespec, our uh, committee policy analyst, will help walk us through the document. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to you to get us started, Mr. Stinespec. Thank you, Chair. For the record, Jan Stinespec with the uh, Lesser Council Bureau um, yeah, the research division, and um, as the chair said, the work session document is posted online. You should have a copy in front of you. Um, the work session document that was compiled by staff and the chair to assist the committee in determining which legislative measures it will request um, for the 2023 session of the Nevada legislature, as well as other actions the committee may endorse. Um, with that, the first uh, set of recommendations under uh, item A um, from the public lands um, uh, were actually um, um, recommended this morning by the subcommittee, and the majority of those uh, recommendations were passed unanimously, with the exception of E. Seven, which is under uh, endangered species, the request to draft the bill to authorize the Nevada Department of Wildlife to manage non-pest insects, including without limitation endangered butterflies. Uh, that recommendation did uh, pass as well. And as I previously mentioned, the rest of the uh, recommendations were passed unanimously. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Stenisbeck. Um Based on, I guess, two things. First of all, um, I would like to thank uh, Chair Carlton for uh, for running the subcommittee on public lands. Uh, very much appreciate uh, your service and we'll take any opportunity I can uh, over the next couple of months to, to do so. It's been an honor serving with you and, and appreciate all your hard work uh, on, behalf of, um, on behalf of the entire state of Nevada. Uh, with that, members, I'd like to um, open up the possibility of considering all of the items except item E7 um, in one motion. So uh, I, I'd like to, uh, we can still have, uh, uh, since it was passed unanimously, all the others uh, with bipartisan and support from tribal and local governments uh, would still have the opportunity if someone would like to make comments about specific items, but um, would like to, uh, to see if there's any issue with taking everything but E7 together and then taking E7, um, which had a, a a bit more um, a debate about it separately. So, does anyone have an issue with that? All right. Uh, Mr. Chair, so, if I could. Uh, uh, yeah. Go Senator Goykachia. Uh, yeah, just a comment. And, uh, you know, as we look at uh, B4, uh, you know, we definitely support it. Uh, the dialogue and that coming forward to the legislature, the whole body. But I, I don't want anyone to be thinking that this isn't going to be a heavy, heavy lift. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Senator. And uh, I, I know that uh, Chair Carlton mentioned that she uh, feels fortunate that she won't be in the legislature uh, in next session to, to handle that. Uh, you know, I, I will just speak briefly, um, you know, to that issue. Uh, you know, I've heard a lot of the, the public comments, um, you know, first of all, to concerns that this is uh, a, an agency driven process. It's not. It's being driven by the legislature, by the subcommittee on public lands based on, on testimony that they've heard and then by this full committee. Um, and 
uh, I intend to uh, lead the efforts to bring that broad and completely inclusive group of stakeholders together. Um, there is no language that is sitting around on this right now, so we're going to be relying on feedback from uh, everybody across the state to figure out if there is uh, some consensus that can, uh, again, be specific to the conditions in a, in a given basin um, or basins uh, to, you know, to, to do this conjunctive management, um, to make sure that science is being used as the basis for those decisions. Um, I, you know, I, I do not see uh, this as approaching the issues of um, monitoring management and mitigation plans in any way. Um, so I just wanted to, and, and you know, and not to, uh, uh, you know, rather to clarify some of the existing language, not to uh, throw the prior appropriation doctrine out the window. So I just wanted to to put those things on the record as well. And yes, it is going to be a heavy lift. We'll we'll see how far we can move it. Um, is there any other uh, questions or comments before I uh, accept a motion? And we can still have discussion on the motion. So, seeing none, um, I would accept a motion to approve all of the uh, public land subcommittee's recommendations with the exception of E7. So moved. We have a motion from Assemblywoman Carlton. We have a second. Second from uh, Vice Chair Donate. Uh, any discussion on the motion? One other thing that I will mention is uh, you know, the only uh, modification to that uh, work session document, there was a discussion uh, about the position statement on uh, water projects in Utah. We uh, softened that language a bit from opposition to expressing concerns with some of those projects and encouraging ongoing collaboration um, in addressing uh, water issues along the Colorado River. All right. Seeing no other discussion, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye or raising your hands. Aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. All right, with that, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, with that, um, we'll now um, move on to uh, item E7 from the subcommittee's recommendations. Mr. Stanisbeck, could you please um, lead us through a discussion of that? Uh, thank you, Chair. The item E7 was to request the drafting of a bill to authorize the Nevada Department of Wildlife to manage non-pest insects, including without limitation, endangered uh, butterflies. As previously mentioned, um, that recommendation came from a presentation um, uh, in Nixon, Nevada. Um, I believe it was June 27th. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, based on some of the comments that were had at the uh, subcommittee level, I appreciate the discussion. I guess the only thing I'd add is, again, that uh, the idea is to make sure that this management authority exists in our state. Uh, definitely heard concerns around conflict with federal authority. The goal, um, in as I envision it, is to prevent federal listings, which are extremely restrictive. We know we've done these efforts, for example, on sage grouse, which is uh, you know a species that that the Department of Wildlife manages. Um, and the goal is to have scientists monitoring populations and taking actions to um, help preserve those in order to avoid federal listing, at which point it's taken completely uh, out of the state's hands. And so uh, as the as Chair Carlton mentioned in subcommittee, uh, we can have a, a discussion about um, you know, where that authority should be housed, since the, the original recommendation is to house it at the agency that um, oversees uh, other wildlife uh, populations, that's where we've decided to start. So uh, with that, I'd be glad to open it up to uh, uh, other members of the committee for questions or comments. Mr. Chair, <clears throat> Senator Gorky, for the record. Sen 
and again, as one of the descending votes coming out of the out of the subcommittee, I, I am concerned about again and how predominantly sportsman driven sportsman fees. Uh, how you're going to separate that? Uh, we don't. We do have a season on sage grouse. Uh, I haven't seen one on the butterfly yet. Uh, so anyway, I, I'm very concerned about that, and I, I think we clearly. If we're looking at managing some of these sensitive species or endangered species, uh, we probably need to look to a different agency, if, if for no more than just the separation of the funding. Thank you, Senator. I uh, appreciate you getting those comments on the record. I will note that Endow manages um, all of the, the wildlife species, so it doesn't include these invertebrates, of course, but otherwise they manage all uh, wildlife across the state, including those that are are not game species, so I just wanted to make sure that that is clear. Uh, Assemblywoman Hansen, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. I hope my internet's working okay. Um, I just want to reiterate that we did not have the, um, any input from Endow at that at that meeting in Nixon, and I guess I would want them to be more involved in this conversation if we're looking to go in that direction. So uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, we do not have the department here today. I will say that they have not um, submitted any comments to this point expressing uh, support or opposition uh, for, for this concept. And uh, they would certainly be at the top of the stakeholders uh, involved in this discussion. Uh, if it moves forward into a bill in the legislature. Any other uh, questions or, or comments? All right. Seeing none, I would accept a motion to approve uh, item E7 from the Subcommittee on Public Lands. So moved. I have a motion from Assemblywoman Carlton, a second from Vice Chair Donate. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. Nay. Raise your hands. Nay. Thank you. So we have uh, nays from Assemblywoman Hansen, Assemblyman Ellison, and Senator Goykachia. Okay. Did I miss anything? Recording the vote properly? Thank you. Uh, with that, that motion does pass. Uh, we'll move on to the next item in our work session document. Uh, we are now at item B, uh, wildlife conservation. Mr. Stinnisbeck, will you please lead us through the uh, work session document for this item. Thank you, Chair. For the record, Jan Stinnisbeck with the Research Division of the LCB. Um, uh, the next recommendation on the work session document under B2 is to request the drafting of a bill to establish and fund an account with the purpose to identify, construct, and maintain uh, wildlife crossings. Uh, this um, was recommended by, the, by uh, a variety of uh, conservation groups, the Pew Charitable Trust, the Nevada Conservation League, uh, Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, amongst others. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Stenisbeck. Um We'll open it up for uh, uh, any questions or comments from the members, I'll just say at the outset that, uh, it, of course, this uh, BDR does mention funding. It does not mention a funding source. Again, this is something that um, will be discussed uh, during the legislature about um, how, how that happens and to what extent. But uh, as was noted in public comment, the bipartisan infrastructure law set aside hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to help expedite the construction of these crossings, which allows us, um, and, and Nevada has frankly been a leader in the construction of these, but they're usually incorporated into larger um, highway projects. This gives us the opportunity to help accelerate some of those and put some people to work and get 90% uh, or more of the cost for those projects covered by the federal government. So. Uh, with that, members have any uh, questions or comments about this item? Assemblywoman Hansen, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a couple questions. I, I'm, you know, I'm in support, but would like a little bit 
more information. I, I get the concept. I, I see, you know, them in certain parts of the state. Uh, but who, who does the remind me, who determines uh, these routes? Like I'm, a, I'm sure that most of them are based on migratory routes of antelope, deer, that sort of thing. So number one, who's determining where the routes are and are wild horses considered, I mean, do they, I'm not aware that wild horses use these per se, but just a little clarification, please. Of course, thank you. Uh, I'll start with the second question first, which is that uh, wild horses are not actually, um, do not fall under the definition of wildlife. So crossings that are designated only for wild horses would not um, fall under this. However, if they were being constructed for mule deer or other types of uh, game animals or other wildlife, um, then then that would fall under that. Um, to your other point about uh, who kind of makes those decisions, uh, the Department of Wildlife does uh, most of the studies on migration paths. However, the Department of Transportation keeps quite a bit of information on um, uh, wildlife um, collisions. And so my understanding is that both agencies have uh, uh, essentially a kind of priority list that largely overlap between which areas could provide the best benefits for wildlife being able to move essentially from one side of the road to the other. Um, and uh, which areas would have the greatest impact on reducing uh, vehicle impacts in the state. Could I follow uh, and, up and with one, one more question? Yes, you may. And let me just um, really quickly say, so, you know, essentially these are highway projects. And so um, usually those are ultimately kind of come down to the Department of Transportation, but are informed by uh, that wildlife information. So go ahead with your follow-up. And that that might have answered this question. So the maintenance of those uh, structures, um, like if there's a fire and maybe the route has changed with the wildlife, and um, or if they they need maintenance, is it the highway department that's that's maintaining those? Thank you for that question. I believe that's correct. As you know, we do have occasionally have, uh, you know, odds and ends in the state. I know in other committees we discuss the uh, Cave Lake Dam, which is Department of Wildlife Dam, as opposed to uh, Division of Water Resources Dam. But my uh, my understanding at this time is that these would all be uh, Department of Transportation projects. So they would be in charge of uh, constructing and maintaining them again. Uh, in communication and collaboration with the Department of Wildlife. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, additional questions? I believe I have Assemblyman Ellison. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One thing I would like to request, uh, I won't be there during the session, but I would like a request when they do go into a county that they're, they're looking at uh, uh, you know, doing the bridges or whatever, that they get public comment at that point in time? Thank you very much for that, uh, uh, Assemblyman Ellison. And uh, I think I appreciate you noting that for the record. And I believe that the Department of Transportation has kind of a project list and, and does public engagement. And I think we want to encourage them to make sure that that they do that and uh, reach out to the local communities and have continue to have a open and inclusive process. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, additional comments on this item? All right. Seeing none, I uh, accept a motion to approve. I have a motion from Assemblywoman Carlton, a second from Vice Chair Donate. Is there any discussion on this motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Seeing none, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Mr. Stinnisbeck, will you lead us to the next item? Thank you, Chair, for recognizing Stinnisbeck for the Research Division. Uh, the next item 
is item number three, and it requests the drafting of a bill to adjust the predator fee, which is the fee charged for processing each application for a game tag, the proceeds from which are used to carry out various acti activities, including the management control of predatory wildlife. Uh, this bill would seek to remove certain changes made by Assembly Bill 78 from a 2015 legislative session, including without limitation the removal of the requirement to use 80% of the predator fee for the lethal management control of predatory wildlife. Uh, this was recommended by uh, Chair Watts. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll get us started on this one. Um, you know, we heard from the Department of Wildlife in our first meeting um, around some of the challenges that they have with, with populations, and those have also been mentioned in, in for, by different commenters. And, uh, you know, ultimately, we've had this program that was uh, created to be paid for by sportsmen um, for the benefit of big game habitats, and uh, it has not really delivered on on that promise uh, and is now uh, you know highly restricted to one purpose which is lethal predator removal and so uh, the concept of this is uh, to restore the flexibility to the agency to use it for um, whatever purpose they believe would best benefit benefit uh, big game populations um, you know that may be uh, habitat work uh, maybe uh, you know trying to address to the best ability they can um, uh, competition um, with with other uh, species uh, on that habitat um, and it could uh, certainly very well include um, lethal predator removal but it would restore the flexibility for the agency to do whatever um, uh, you know they believe and the science informs is best to um, uh, going to have the biggest bang for the buck in terms of uh, helping our big game populations throughout the state. So with that, I'd open it up to um, questions and comments from other members. Okay, uh, we'll start with Assemblywoman Hanson, then we'll go to Assemblyman Ellison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I've got I've got big concerns with this one. Um, I guess I, I'm not getting the idea that I don't know where the testimony maybe I missed something on that's not delivering the predator program. This was asked for by the sportsmen in the 90s. They asked for this fee. Um, have we heard from sportsmen? Have we? I, I, I don't recall hearing from the bighorn sheep people. Um, Certainly, we know there are predator issues for sure. Uh, mountain lion, um, is it because we don't use the predator control in areas that are more politically correct versus incorrect? Um, I just think this issue is really at the heart of a lot of the problems. As I've talked to people in the, in, that are sportsmen, speak to my constituents in these rural areas, Predator control is something they don't want to have a scale back on. And so I, I have some real concerns about moving those funds elsewhere. Um, also, uh, maybe even a fee increase uh, if, if that were necessary. And uh, like I said, the sportsman asked for this originally, which uh, is indicative that they're willing to be problem solvers um, in order to help, 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 help the herds across the board. So um, at this point, I, I can't support this measure, um, but looking for more information as we have some more discussion. All right. Thank you for those comments. And um, I, I think I tried to address some of those in, in my initial remarks. But again, this would be a, a proposal that would go before the, the legislature next session and, and uh, have a, a lot of additional discussion um, in committee and during that session. Um, uh, yeah, so I'll just leave it at that for now, but appreciate your appreciate your comments on the record. Uh, Assemblyman Ellison, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, you know, for the last 12 years, I've been hearing about predator control and the, and the funding, and the funding was not being used, and, and people testified over and over and over that the money was not being used for what it was intended to, 
and that was predator control. The mountain lions, uh, you know, you see wolves now coming into parts of Nevada. You see all these problems out there, but it seems like that the funding is building up more and more every day in that account, and it's not being used. So I, I'm going to be a strong no on this, and I'm hoping during the session that uh, when this bill does come out, I, I'll be there, I hope, uh, as a private citizen in opposition to this bill. But uh, I'm hoping we can work it out prior. Uh, but they, they need to talk to the sportsmen because uh, they're, they're really unhappy with uh, uh, these funds not being used what they're supposed to. And the deer population is dropping dramatically, and why? Uh, and you can see why. It's because of the predators. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Assemblyman Ellison. I appreciate that. And uh, I, I think while we uh, disagree a bit on the solution, uh, I think you hit the nail on the head, which is that our, our mule deer populations have not recovered. And so um, I believe, and, and yes, there's been actually difficulty in, in um, you know, spending these funds based on the limitations that currently exist in statute, um, which is uh, you know, why this bill would propose to uh, open up uh, some of that to whatever we think is going to do the most uh, to help get those populations back up. And again, wouldn't prevent uh, the use of, uh, of predator removal um, to the extent that that's considered uh, the most effective strategy. Senator Goikachia, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, just to comment, uh, I don't know why we haven't heard from the county advisory boards or the Wildlife Commission on this. I mean, clearly, that's where this bill should have come forward from. Uh, not, I don't believe out of this uh, out of this committee, and uh, of course, as a strong advocate for predator control over the years, I on the ground some of these projects are work are really working. Uh, you know, the the project they funded uh, on the diamonds, which is right in my backyard, has been very successful. I mean, it, it shows the fawn recruitment there. Ultimately, though, uh, it isn't enough, and yet we're talking about reducing that. I'm sorry, I'm an adamant no. Thank you, Senator. Any additional comments? Assemblywoman Carlton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I just want to make it clear that I don't think anyone's actually saying to reduce it. We're talking about giving the flexibility. If another issue arises, let's say there's a disease that hits a herd and they need the money to be able to go in and do some mitigation, or if there's a fire and they can't get to water, to be able to go in and airdrop, do whatever they need to do this limits how funding should be spent. And I believe having the flexibility to address all the different issues that might impact these herds, depending upon the year. If the predator is the issue that year, spend more than 80% if you have to. But if it's not that year, they should have the flexibility to spend 50% and move some of those dollars to deal with some of the other issues that might be out there. We're only here every couple of years and I'm always wary of designating how much absolutely has to be spent because you're going to run into a problem and they're going to have to come back to interim finance and say, oh, we need money for something else. So I believe this will give them the flexibility that they need and the people that we appoint to do these jobs should be given the opportunity to address the issues that are in front of them. So I'm, I'm fine with it. Believe me, I've learned a lot about predator control between coyotes and mountain lions here in southern Nevada. So I get it. I mean, when they're walking the back wall and you're looking at a mountain lion on a wall uh, and your daughter's calling you on the phone going, Mom, this thing's about to eat my dog, um, you know, it's, it's scary out there. We get it, even in southern Nevada. So I don't think this is politically motivated or regional or sectional in any way. I just think we need to be able to spend the dollars where they need to be spent and they shouldn't be restricted. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any additional discussion for members? If I may have a second to... I'll indulge you. Go ahead, Senator. Thank you. And, and Thank you. unfortunately, yeah, yeah. I unfortunately, not, I don't want to argue with the, the chair of uh, the subcommittee, but again, that's what triggered the passage of Assembly Bill 78. This predatory fee was in place from the 90s, and that's exactly why we brought it forward. The money wasn't getting expended on the ground, and therefore we weren't getting the controls we needed. And again, I think the... The numbers reflect that. Thank you. And uh, at, that, at this point, I'll cut this off so it doesn't become a back and forth. Um, with that, unless anyone else 
Seeing nobody else would like to weigh in, I would uh, accept a motion to uh, approve item number three. I've got a motion from Assemblyman Owen Carlton. I've got a second from Vice Chair Donate. Is there any discussion on the motion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye and raising your hand. Aye. aye. All those opposed, please say nay. Raise nay. Your hand. Okay, so I have Assemblywoman Hansen, Assemblyman Ellison, and, and Senator Goikachia in opposition. Do we record the vote properly? Looks so. Uh, with that, the motion does carry. Uh, with that, Mr. Sinspec, can you uh, introduce item number four, please? Thank you, Chair, for the record. Jan Sinspec with the Resource Division. Um, C4 requests the drafting of a bill that directs the Department of Health and Human Services and the State Department of Conservation and Natural Resources to work with stakeholders during the 2023-2024 interim to identify how the state can increase access to outdoor recreation and how um, uh, such access can be implemented as treatment for issues related to uh, physical and mental uh, health. This recommendation was based on testimony uh, during a joint uh, in, uh, meeting with um, the Joint Term Standing Committee on Health and Human Services on June 16th. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Stenisbeck. Um, I'd just like to note um, for everyone's awareness that uh, following the publication of this work session document, we received additional information from the Division of Outdoor Recreation at the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, indicating that uh, they have incorporated this uh, health into their mission and that outdoor recreation is incorporated into uh, some of the work of the uh, Office of Minority Health and Equity. Um, so this working group is essentially already kind of established um, and, and starting to move forward. So um, I would be inclined to not take action on this at this time and uh, simply say while I have a moment on the record that we ap appreciate that work and encourage it to continue with the incorporation of all the stakeholders in kind of the outdoor recreation and healthcare sector. We need providers, we need insurers, and uh, we need everyone to, to work together to figure out how we can um, how we can get people outdoors uh, again to keep them healthy both physically and mentally. Um, do, do any other members have any comments on this? All right. Seeing none, I believe that we will, uh, we, we do not need to take action on this. We can just move forward to the next item. Just so we'll, we'll be withdrawing that item. And with that, we'll move on to item five. Thank you, Chair Vargas. Record Jan Stinnespec with the Research Division of the LCB. Um, D5 requests the drafting of a bill to require that during the 2023-2024 interim, the Joint Home Stand Committee on Natural Resources study state agencies that regulate natural resources. Uh, this interim study will include, without limitation, the examination of the mission, scope, and composition of the Board of Wildlife Commissioners, um, the State Environmental Commission, and the Commission on Mineral Resources. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, this is a, the, another of my recommendations. So um, just to provide some additional background, we, we heard um, in public comment and during some of these meetings, um, uh, people expressing concerns um, and, and offering suggestions for modifying the makeup or, or the, the scope of the Board of Wildlife Commissioners. I know that uh, other members of this subcommittee have brought forward um, legislation to, to modify the makeup of that board, and uh, those discussions have come from a variety of perspectives. Uh, I myself introduced uh, legislation uh, looking to uh, modify um, how we regulate our, our minerals, and we've heard discussion around, um, again, around the management of, of wildlife and different species. And so uh, this kind of comes as the culmination of all of that. And we have the Sunset Subcommittee uh, that looks at, at entities, but really uh, the primary purpose of that is to make sure that they are meeting and that they are following their their responsibility as laid out in statute this would really take a step back to look at um, what their charge is and what the makeup of, of some of these appointed bodies are. And if 
that study determines that uh, it's time to make some adjustments um, that could be made and, and it really approaching it from the perspective of uh, let's first begin by hearing what other states are doing and getting perspective from uh, a broad section of the community instead of starting from the position of introducing a proposal and debating the pros and cons of that. So that is the uh, uh, what led to the, uh, the proposing of, of this measure. So I'll open it up to uh, discussion among the members. And we'll start with Assemblywoman Hansen. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you again, Mr. Chair. Um, a quick question and then possibly a comment. Can I and all of us be reminded if we have the ability to, to tell us what the makeup is for the Wildlife Commission, like what the members have to represent? Oh, I, uh, this is off the top of my head. I believe it's a nine member board, five are sportsmen. Uh, there's one farmer, one rancher, one member of the general public, and one conservation. Okay, thank you for that. And I'm very impressed that you did that off the top of your head. Uh, I, I forget, we don't always have legal here <laughs> when we're doing work sessions. Um, I, I'm, I'm not very supportive of this measure. I, we, it seems like we revisit this idea of the makeup of the composition of the Wildlife Commission. I'm not so much concerned maybe about the others. Uh, the Wildlife Commission has, by, by virtue of, of what it is and what it's dealing with, has had controversy over the decades. Um, and it's all gover governor appointed, as, as I recall. And so I don't, I don't see the need. Uh, the majority of the state is of the land mass, I think, is proportionally covered because the majority of our, our land here is, you know, I mean, ranching, um, sportsman use, public land sort of things. And I feel like the composition kind of reflects that and has been sensitive to that in the past. So, um, in my mind, I'm not comfortable with including that, uh, the Wildlife Commission, in this recommendation. Thank you for that, Assemblywoman. Um, and we do have legal here. I just uh, have spent uh, too much time uh, uh, on these issues, and so I, I'm able to was able to recall that. Um, you know, what I would say is, again, we wanted this to be broad and we, you know, we wanted to kind of put everything out on the table for consideration. But again, you know, as you'll note in the in the backup and and, you know, I'll reaffirm this in, in my comments, um, this isn't approaching it with a any predetermined outcome in mind. So this uh, would task the next interim with setting aside time, just as we set aside time in this interim to dive in a little bit more on water issues and water conservation, the next interim would dedicate some extended time to look at um, the kind of regulation systems for, for natural resources, right? And that includes, you know, um, wildlife, air quality, water quality, mining, um, to see how other places do it and to hear from everyone on what they think should or should not be changed and why. And then that could potentially lead in that next interim to no action or action on one or more of these um, with reform. So uh, I just want to make sure that it's clear that this is uh, not being put forward specifically to change the geographic makeup or qualifications for any of these, any of these things but rather to take to actually take the time to look at it and to do that outside the context of any one um, member or entity bringing forward a, a specific proposal to change. I think it's time to take, take a, a step back and look at these things and then decide um, what, if any, changes are needed based on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I do appreciate that thoughtful um, answer. It, it, it does make sense. Um, I guess I wish I had thought of that when we were talking about the predator control. I'd like us to have an interim study then on, <laughs> I know it's a different subject, but if we're going to spend time during the interim, 
justifiably studying these commissions, then perhaps I could put a little plug in that we fold that into a study to have predator control studied during the interim um, so we could come up with some solutions as well. So thank you for that explanation. Thank you. And this will all be in the Committee on Natural Resources next session, and I am sure you'll be right there for it. Uh, any other uh, questions or comments from members? Just a comment. On this item? Mr. Chair, Senator Greg Chia for the record. And uh, I, can, I can support this again. Uh, it just giving direction, I'm, I'm kind of wondering why we really need a bill draft to do it rather than direction to the, uh, you know, the next interim committee and uh, possibly we'll be sitting on it. But again, this, this decision ultimately will be made in a 25 session. So uh, uh, again, interim studies don't hurt. Direction for this committee uh, would be great. All right. Thank you very much, Senator. I appreciate that. And, you know, again, we're, we're also still navigating our way through this new interim structure. And uh, as, as uh, folks know, previously we would, we would create more committees to do the studies. <laughs> um, and so now as we're trying to consolidate things, um, this is the idea of just making sure that it's very clear so it's not a, a, not a letter asking, um, but really, uh, uh, you know, directing that next interim uh, to take this on as part of its workload. So any other uh, uh, comments or questions on this? All right, seeing none, I would accept a motion to approve item D5. So moved. I have a motion from Assemblywoman Carlton. I have a second. Up, oh, second from Vice Chair Donate. Didn't see you there for a minute, thank you. Um, any discussion on the motion? Assemblywoman Hansen. So this is why we have good discussion. Um, Chair Watts, I want to tell you that I, I think that your answer to my concerns uh, helped me get to be more comfortable. And then Senator Gogachia put the bow on the box. So I think I can go ahead and support this as an interim uh, study um, with hopes that we might do the same with predator control. So thank you for helping relieve my concern. Thank you very much for, for expressing that. I think it was a very healthy discussion. Any other discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All right. Any opposed, please say nay or raise your hand. Seeing none, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. With that, we'll move on to item number six. Item number six is to request the drafting of a bill to require local governments to include in their master plan a plan for heat mitigation during their urban planning and local coal development efforts. Heat mitigation may include without limitation the use and promotion of urban tree canopies and other means to provide shade over paved services, cool pavement, and access to public cool spaces and drinking water. Uh, this recommendation was also um, uh, based on um, uh, presentations by the Nature Conservancy in the City of Phoenix during the June 16 uh, joint meeting with uh, the Joint Trump State Committee on Health and Human Services. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Stinnespeck. Um, so with that, I'll open it up to the committee for uh, discussion. Any questions? I believe we have Senator Gokichia. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess my concerns, uh, and, and I would be opposing this, if we can't get in at least some type of a pop cap, this could be a real hardship on some of the smaller rural counties. I mean, they don't have to deal with this, uh, especially some of the requirements that would be in this bill. So I, I guess that's where I'm coming from. Uh, you know, clearly there are urban areas, some of the more populated metro areas of this uh, of the state and counties that would need to deal with, it, you know, this in their planning and clearly should, but to apply it statewide, I'd be opposed. Thank you for that, Senator. I know that we do, and, uh, I, you know, I, I will confess, I know that there are different um, planning requirements for local governments and that they, they do uh, fluctuate based on size and um, so I think we would definitely want to have this incorporated into the, the most robust planning that the uh, largest counties do. Um, I think uh, very much 
open to seeing how, uh, you know, whether those fit in with smaller counties if it needed to be modified or, or uh, excluded in some way. And I believe we have uh, Assemblywoman Hansen next. Thank you again. Uh, I share those same concerns. Uh, you know, certainly we covered this before. We all love trees, and there are some. Uh, but you know, go to these some of these smaller communities, and you, you'll see a lot of those trees. But again, when we require from the state, local governments, um, these kind of mandates can can really be a hardship. So I, I would support. And wondering, could we include a pop cap? kind of verbiage in this recommendation now, uh, much like we did um, on public land um, with Chair Carlton, um, giving some comfort with the, the word opposition to maybe more of a cooperative. Could we, because at this point I can't support it the way it's written uh, or recommended, but I could maybe get there if we took into consideration population. All right. Um, at this, I, I think. Do we have a, a question or comment from Assemblyman Ellison? Thank you, Mr. Chair. In Thank last you, session, Chair. we run into a problem with the pop caps getting them passed. Um, but what I would recommend is that this committee recommended that it be considered a population on this bill, and I think everybody be in favor of it. But if not, then you know, we'd have to oppose it because uh, these little small companies can't make it as it is right now. They're, they're struggling. So I hope we take this into consideration and, and in the bill, put it in there that we look at a population cap on this based on the issues that were presented just now. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I appreciate that. And uh, I do know that, um, that, yeah, we've tried to Tried to move away from population caps. Um, I, I do believe that we have different um, planning requirements for uh, different local governments. And I guess at this point, I would uh, I'd like to call in our um, our legal to uh, maybe just expound a little bit, if possible, on some of the different. Um, uh, local government planning requirements and if there are differences based on county size or, or other factors. Uh, Alan Ambrim for the record, uh, Legal Division. So I do know that there are different provisions dealing with different counties and different governments. Off the top of my head, I cannot recite those. I could look them up, but that is, uh, would be beneficial for the committee. Um, if we want to get into population caps, um, I can provide clarification on that, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Amburn. And you know, essentially, I know that there are already um, some local governments that have uh, kind of conservation um, elements to their plan, and so this could fit, uh, you know, essentially within that. Uh, and if that is something that's only um, done by the larger counties currently, then it could be uh, kind of connected to that. So it wouldn't be necessarily introducing new population caps, but again, matching it to some of the existing statutory language um, and some of those those existing conservation plan elements, which I believe are currently really done by the larger um, local government entities. Uh, Alan Emmer, for the record, sorry, Chair, I wasn't sure if that was a question. Um, so, yes, we could uh, clarify in this BDR that we're focusing on the larger counties or the larger municipalities, and then when we go and actually draft it, make sure that we're addressing the local ordinances or jurisdictions and the, and the codes that are dealing with those larger cities or municipalities or even counties, if that's the approach we would like to take. Thank you, Mr. Amber. And I guess I'll turn it over back to uh, Senator Gokachia. So, um, having been in uh, having been in local government yourself, I'm sure you're familiar with some of these uh, differences. So, you think uh, something like that that is in alignment with some of the existing differences in planning between different government entities would that help alleviate some of your concerns? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, clearly it will. And and again. Uh, at it will require a bill that comes forward, and clearly as we draft that bill, we will 
uh, you know, we'll be able to take it up and craft the bill to, to make it fit those differences between jurisdictions. But just so as a committee we recognize with the, with the bill draft request, we are going to recognize the fact that there are differences in counties and therefore should be differences in requirements. Thank you. Thank you. Well said. Any other discussion among the members? All right. Uh, seeing none, I would accept a motion to approve item E6 um, you know, with the understanding that this would uh, take into consideration the existing differences in planning between different local governments. I have a motion from Assemblywoman Carlton, a second from Vice Chair Donate. Is there any discussion on the motion? Okay. Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. Thank you. With that, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, we'll now move on to item number seven. Uh, Ganesh Tinesburg of the Research Division. Item seven is to propose to draft a position statement um, in the committee's final report expressing support for funding for the uh, Desert Research Institute within the Nevada System of Higher Education and its programs, including uh, seating operations. Um, this, uh, this, uh, Recommendation was based on testimony during the June, June 16th meeting. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Stenisbeck. I believe this was also something that was um, mentioned and had some support during the uh, public lands meeting in uh, in Ely as well. Um, you know, essentially, um, we've got uh, a lot of things going on. Uh, drought probably being the, the most present in my mind, and uh, there are research and uh, and program other programs to study and address some of these issues at, at DRI that um, we'd like to uh, generally express uh, our support for. So um, any questions or comments from the members? Assemblywoman Carlton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've always been very supportive of, of DRI. They do wonderful work. I've got a history of not supporting cloud seeding programs for probably close to my whole time in the assembly and probably part of the Senate too. So um, I'll, I'll not be supportive of this, even though I am supportive of DRI, the, the cloud seeding provisions, I, I, I cannot be supportive of so, but just wanted to make sure people understood it's not against DRI. I just have a hard time funding that project. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for those comments. Uh, other uh, questions or comments from members on this item? Uh, I believe we have Assemblyman Ellison. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And for the many, many years uh, uh, working with NDRI and in, in support of cloud seeding, and mostly in some of these areas right now that is being hit, even like Vegas. Uh, I mean, you got, what is it, Charleston or whatever that is right outside of Vegas. Some of these areas need to be looked at. They get that extra water in there. And so I, I support this. And I don't know where the funding is going to come from. I mean, it's going to be a, a hard road to get. but. Uh, I think that this is something they really, really need to look at some of these areas throughout the state that's got uh, drought problems. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Donate. Uh, thank you so much, Chair Watts. Um, this is an interesting subject. Uh, I, I've done a few readings on cloud seeding. So I do share the same sentiments of um, Assemblywoman Carlton. Can we perhaps make a modification to scratch the last part of including cloud seeding operations? My reasoning for that is there is, we, we don't know the effectiveness of this research yet and the negative ramifications it can have on health. But I think in general, in general, we do want to continue supporting uh, the research that DRI is doing, in, including uh, with with weather and climate change. So would, is that something that we could be open to modifying for this proposal before we take a vote? 
Uh, well, it seems like if we want to move this forward, we're going to have to. Uh, so uh, it would just be to generally support the uh, programs of the Desert Research Institute then, and funding for those. So it would not take a position either yes or no on cloud seeding. Any other questions, discussion on this? Chair Watts, uh, this is Alan Amburn from up in Carson City. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Amburn. So just to make sure that I, I understand, so we're removing the language, quote, including cloud seeing operations, end quote? That would be correct. We don't have a motion on the floor yet, but it seems like that's what folks are aligning around. Thank you, sir. Thank you. With that, uh, I would accept a motion to approve item number seven um, with the modification just described by uh, Mr. Amburn. So I've got a motion from Assemblywoman Carlton. Second. Second from Vice Chair Donate. Discussion on the motion. Mr. Chair, so go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Up. We're going to do Assemblywoman Carlton, then we'll go to, to you, Senator Kokichia. And thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This does not mean that DRI cannot use the dollars that do get appropriated to them. It gives them the choice of where to spend the dollars. And if the data shows that's what they should do, then they can do it. But we're not delineating dollars to be spent on something if the data doesn't back it up. So I thank the committee very much for taking this under consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? Uh, Senator Goykachia, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And of course, I, I support cloud seeding. We only have to have to look to the West to see how the beneficial that is in California. So, uh, but again, it's only a position statement, and uh, I can I can support it either way. But I just wanted to go on the record saying I do support cloud seeding. I think it is valuable, and I think DRI supports it. Understood. Thank you, Senator. Additional discussion on the motion. I don't believe I'm seeing any. So all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. All right. Mr. Uh, it looks Mr. Like Chairman. That. Yep. Go yes. ahead, Assemblyman yeah. Allison. Uh, I support the the, the, the uh, seating strongly, but I'm I'm scared that the language we just took out might hurt some of these areas. So. I'm going to vote no. I'm just hoping to God that you guys can work this out and put that back in when you get into committee. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Assemblyman Ellison. So Assemblyman Ellison uh, did vote nay. I believe is the only member voting uh, no on that. And with that, that item does pass. Uh, with that, we will move on to item number F8. For the record, again, Schlinsbeck with the Resource Division of the LCB, uh, F8 is to request the drafting of a bill to require uh, that the Division of Environmental Protection uh, work with the Office of Minority Health and Equity and other relevant agencies to identify areas that are most at risk uh, from cumulative environmental impacts and convene a working group with stakeholders to define environmental justice, uh, focus areas, and make recommendations to reduce these risks. And I believe that this... Um, Recommendation was based on testimony and discussions during the joint meeting of the Joint Interim Standing Committee on and Natural Resources with the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Health and Human Services on June 16th. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Stinsbeck. And uh, did what just uh, Mr. Stinsbeck correctly noted that this came out of discussion. Um, just want to note for those following the agenda that um, while the Nature Conservancy did um, provide items 9 and 10 on its uh, response to our solicitation of recommendations, uh, it did not uh, recommend item number 8 and did not take a specific position on this. This, this came out of uh, committee uh, um, discussions at our joint meeting with uh, interim HHS. So with that, um, we'll open it up to questions, discussion from members. Assemblywoman Carlton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And unfortunately, I could not participate in the joint meeting. So would this be more under the jurisdiction of Health and Human Services, or would this be more under the in, our environmental entities? 
Thank you. Uh, this would be a collaboration. Um, I, I personally see it as being led by the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, so we heard a lot about um, uh, environmental justice that day and communities that um, have a lot of kind of stacking impacts from pollution and, and other environmental issues. Um, while there are some uh, some definitions and tools that have been out there. Uh, I, I personally believe it kind of varies based on the the dynamics of each state. And so instead of um, just kind of picking something up, the, the main thing that this is doing is asking um, all of those agencies to come together and, and um, you know, bring in our, our researchers and others to get all the data that we can about air quality, water quality, um, and, and other environmental impacts, whether that's uh, uh, you know energy insecurity or other things, to find out what are the communities that have all these things kind of stacking on top of them, where are they, and then um, being able to use that to figure out what solutions um, you know might might be best and really target them, where they can check off a few of those boxes so that that everybody's. Um, you know, uh, everybody can thrive in this state, and again, that can be, that could be rural, it could be urban, um, and, and instead of defining it on, on some of those specific boundaries, do, doing the research first, um, and then using that to inform, um, you know, any future initiatives. And thank you. I, I appreciate that. I know Health and Human Services has a really heavy lift every single session, and even during the interim, because it's such a broad spectrum that falls under that. So having these entities take the lead to be able to give information to Health and Human Services, I believe, is, is the, the best path forward for them. Otherwise, I think it could be lost in all the other Health and Human Services issues that the state is facing. So I appreciate that, and I, I'm supportive of that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Open it up to other members. Uh, Senator Goykachia. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and my concern is to echo uh, the, the comments of Assemblywoman Carlton, I, I'm concerned about we're charging these agencies, and they're already facing, in many cases, a 40% vacancy rate, and and we're going to give them, assign them some more duties, uh, folks. They've got a lot of hurdles to get over. So, uh, you know, I, I don't care whether it is NDEP or Health and Human. Uh, these these agencies have got a lot to do, and uh, uh, and very short staffed at this point. Uh, so I'm. I, I don't think I'm in, in fact, I'm just not in favor of assigning more duties to them. I'm afraid we're going to end up with a working group, stakeholders. Uh, they'll be spending a lot of time on this, and uh, uh, we're two years down the road, I realize, but the recommendations c could be a little weak. So I'm not going to support it. Thank you. Understood. Thank you, Senator. I won't try and convince you otherwise. I will note that, um, you know, uh, uh, the Division of Environmental Protection had a couple of stakeholder working groups. They did one on waste management, which is continuing to meet on an ongoing basis and hopefully um, uh, really improving and bringing in everyone from, you know, waste management uh, companies to um, sustainability advocates and others um, to, to try and advance that. There was also a uh, work group created by one of the, the measures that I brought forward last year that helped develop a a, an action plan to manage certain um, uh, toxic chemicals in the state, and, and they've released that action plan. So um, my hope is that uh, you know that this is something that uh, they will have the capacity to provide. Although I do just um, you know it comes up at every meeting now, and I think it is worth bringing up that um, you know we do have um, some tremendous issues with. Um, vacancies and with recruitment and retention to our state offices and um, I think we need to look at some pretty significant um, efforts to try and address those issues moving forward and um, look forward to working with with uh, everyone who returns to the legislature um, to tackle that issue because um, as you noted it's not just here it's in healthcare it's in public safety um, it's in education and uh, and we need to do whatever we can to try and address that. So, uh, other discussion from members? Uh, Assemblywoman Hansen, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
I just have reservations about, you know, not to negate the importance of having to have focus and, and learn more about these issues, but to require that the Division of Environmental Protection and DCNR work with the Office of Minority Health and Equity. Uh, I don't know that we have to require them. It seems like we've had a lot of discussion about this. I know nationally and here in our state, I would hope that the Division of Environmental um, Protection and DCNR are very well aware of these and would just really make that effort anyway uh, without us having to require them and have one more. I know this is a recommendation, but then to possibly have a BDR that would require it um, for the reasons already mentioned, um, short staffing, that sort of thing. But I, I would think and I would hope that it's already on their radar and they don't need to be mandated to be more conscientious in these these areas that, that there are concerns. So thank you for the opportunity to put that on the record. Thank you, Assemblywoman Hansen. I believe we do have a representative from the Division of Environmental Protection um, uh, with us. So. Um, yeah, you know, if if they would like to um, say anything, um, just to provide any any perspective um, on on this item, they are welcome to do so. I think I see Mr. Lovato sitting down up in Carson City. So, whenever you're ready, please uh, go ahead and and just provide uh, um, you know some some clarification based on the discussion that's happened so far. Thank you, uh, Chair Watts. Uh, some of you Hanson, Greg Lovato, I'm administrator of the Division of Environmental Protection. Uh, appreciate, uh, I think, the uh, focus and spotlight we've had on environmental justice, um, especially with uh, a number of the uh, initiatives from the uh, current presidential administration, uh, the Justice 40 initiative um, that's accompanying a lot of the infrastructure dollars. Uh, right now, we are um, trying to evaluate um, how to meet the expectations of uh, accruing 40 percent of the benefits from infrastructure dollars that come uh, from the Environmental Protection Agency into our um, water resource and wastewater um, resource infrastructure program and understanding how to um, make sure that the benefits accrue uh, at least 40 percent to uh, underserved communities. So I think, um, you know, looking at environmental justice, uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a broad ranging topic that involves not only pollution control, uh, but it involves land use and economics. And I think that um, it, it's one of these uh, complex challenges that different states have been addressing in different ways. Um, there's, uh, there are some examples of states that have commissioned studies. Um, there's a study that was commissioned in the state of Virginia a few years ago uh, that took a look at um, what are the opportunities and what are the areas um, for addressing environmental justice that I think was helpful in prioritizing it. It, it did take kind of an outside independent look um, rather than, than the state agency. Um, I have learned a bit from the state of Virginia how that's been working. Um, there are other examples um, where states have attempted to uh, mandate um, that permitting requirements um, achieve uh, equity and, and those are often tough. If you're talking about sort of um, quantitative assessments uh, that takes a lot of work to try to quantitatively assess risk. Um, it takes a lot of effort to develop, um, you know, cumulative impact risk analyses. Uh, normally when we're looking at uh, protecting air quality and water quality, we're assessing, you know, standards at the stream or standards at the fence line. Uh, but if you're trying to look at cumulative impacts um, of multiple sources in a watershed, um, or an airshed, and you're not just talking about um, a, a limited uh, range of pollutants that we're normally looking for. If you're talking about, you know, trace elements and things like that that might be of concern, uh, th that's still an area of active and ongoing research uh, that we know the Environmental Protection Agency at the federal level is trying to understand. Um, when you try and do a health impact assessment on a facility, uh, it's still an area of emerging practice, um, would take a lot of resources. So. Um, you know, I, I guess just in, in, in brief, I, I think uh, we are acting uh, with the money we're getting from the federal infrastructure dollars to make sure that we're incorporating environmental justice benefits into our funding programs. Um, when you're talking about um, trying to increase equity throughout 
our entire op set of operations, uh, it does bring in, um, you know, uh, quite a set, uh, a scope that we would need, I think, help um, from some type of independent assessment. And I'd be happy to talk more with the committee about um, what other states have done and research that more. Thank you, Mr. Lovato. So um, I, I would also uh, note that I believe that there's additional environmental justice funds from the Inflation Reduction Act that were just passed. And, uh, you know, I, I would say that that uh, it seems that the intention of this, based on the conversations that were had during that, that joint meeting, is to, again, help inform um, how those are deployed. And it sounds like you know, these studies have been undertaken in, in different ways and in other states. I specifically avoided um, uh, changing permitting requirements. Again, I think it's important that we understand kind of what's going on and what the dynamics of our community are before we look at um, you know, uh, changing permitting requirements or other things like that. So this is really just to begin that process that, uh, that you said is kind of emerging of of looking at these issues and and beginning to understand cumulative impacts outside of um, you know a, one particular um, waterway or one particular fence line for um, for a project, um, and, and uh, I would just say that um, we appreciate your note about um, you know what it would take to carry this out, and again, that's something that would be fully vetted by the next legislature. Um, so we expect your agency to submit a fiscal note and to talk more about the details of um, uh, you know, what this would and would not entail as it, as it develops from a BDR into a bill and goes through the legislative process. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll turn it back over to see if members have any additional questions or clarifications that they'd like while uh, the administrator is, is at the table. All right. A quick one, I'm Mr. Chair, if I, if I may, uh, ahead, Senator Goykachia, for the record. Uh, now, Mr. Lovato, you did mention that Virginia had done it on a, with an outside contractor, and uh, you, kind of a loaded question, uh, <laughs> Greg, uh, do, do you think that might be more beneficial? Thanks, Senator Goykachia. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Greg Lovato, for the record. Uh, I became aware of... Um, you know, the way Virginia approached this um, through discussion at uh, environmental commissioner state conferences. And uh, I think they were uh, trying to figure out um, what the right way to, to do this was. And so um, I didn't learn what type of resources it took at the time. I mean, I've, I've uh, reviewed the study that they had done and they've, they've been uh, moving in, in a certain direction after that. Um, but the thing that I appreciate about it is they talked about um, how they could incorporate it into their strategic planning, what phased program implementation would look like. Um, it, it, they provided an assessment of their authorities and resources. Um, because like I said, environmental justice is a, is a goal that's, um, you know, maybe achieved through, through multiple policies and multiple agencies. I mean, because it has the word environmental in it, I think it kind of tends to end up uh, uh, sitting with uh, environmental regulatory agencies, but when, when you're talking about um, the effect of, uh, you know, land use uh, zoning um, and economics and other things that go into um, what could be a cumulative burden, uh, you know, just picking out the environmental uh, permitting part um, in terms of what we have jurisdiction over may not give a complete picture. So um, I, I could you know, learn more about and, and, and converse more with, with the committee and, and the legislature as, uh, if this bill progresses and, and provide more information and talk with uh, colleagues at Virginia and other states on how they've approached this. Thank you, Mr. Lovato. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you, Mr. Lovato, for coming up and providing some additional information. Uh, okay, well, seeing no other comments at this time, I would uh, accept a motion to approve item F8. So moved. I have a motion from Assemblywoman Carlton, second from Vice Chair Donate. Discussion on the motion. Uh, 
Mr. Chair, Senator Goykachia, for the record, I guess if we broadened it a little bit more, I could support it. But at this point, uh, you know, if, if it was a bill draft requesting that we look at, uh, uh, you know, some way to accomplish environmental justice, or but to to say we're going to with this bill draft, it's going to give NDEP, DCNR, uh, Minority Health and Equity, uh, we're going to assign these duties to them. I can't support it. So thank you. All right. Well, we have we do have a motion on the floor. So um, if if uh, if it's going to be considered to modify that motion, I need to understand uh, uh, what those pain points are. So would would you know essentially having uh, the Division of Environmental Protection undertake um, you know a study including stakeholders on environmental justice issues? Uh, would that be uh, you know? sufficient to address your concerns, leaving it a, a bit broader like that? Leaving it broader and also giving them the ability then possibly to go to an outside contractor. And I believe that, again, I think that's something that would be covered in the legislature, so I don't want to limit it to just that, but I think that would be under under the, the that contemplated uh, broader language would be something that they, they could choose to deal Yes, as long as it, I, you know, the agencies are here, uh, and we're here, and we're going to. Most of us will be voting uh, as long as we moves forward with that understanding that we're not going to handcuff them and we're not going to tie all these agencies, uh, the whole group of them, to having to come up with the plan. So yeah, I can live with it as long as uh, NDEP takes the takes the lead. But we want to make sure they understand that they could, in fact, study it, and even if it requires incorporating outside an outside contractor. And again, that'll be language in the thank bill you. for the legislature. All right, thank you. So want to make sure that this is absolutely clear before we see if the maker of the motion and second wish to consider changes. The proposed changes would be to uh, request the drafting of a bill uh, to require that the Division of Environmental Protection uh, work with stakeholders and conduct a study of environmental justice issues in the state. Thank you, I Mr. Chairman. I, I would agree that um, that and also knowing full well that when a bill is drafted, um, there's no guarantee. So I think a lot of these things will be uh, addressed in that. So if, if that gives the committee a, a larger level of comfort, I'm, I'm happy to amend my motion to include those statements. Thank you. And and again, we'll make sure that the record is clear that a, uh, a contracted study is an option. And again, that will all be evaluated during the next session. Senator, um, is, that, uh, is that amenable to you? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The only one I don't think is really in agreement is Mr. Lovato. <laughs> thank you. All right. Well, we will be working on the language with everybody in uh, a few short months. So, um, Assemblywoman Carlton, you're okay with uh, making that modification as the maker of the motion? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Happy to do it. Thank you. And uh, Vice Chair Donate, are, are you good with seconding that revised motion? Thank you. Um, so, discussion on the revised motion as it stands. Assemblywoman Hansen, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I appreciate the efforts to try to get more comfort with this. I'm still just not there. In fact, I'm a little bit confused <laughs> just because I, I said we're going to say a study, but it already said in there to identify areas which to me is kind of like a study. Um, I, I'm, I'm still not comfortable, but I do appreciate uh, trying to, to make it more amenable. But thank you. All right, thank you. Any other discussion on the motion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. All right, we've got a nay from Assemblywoman Hansen. 
And I just want to be extremely clear, uh, Assemblyman Ellison, how are you voting on this item? Yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm in favor of it with the amendment that uh, was proposed. I, I think that's going to help us get to maybe to first base anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I just want to make sure that we've got the record and the, and the vote clear. So um, with that, we had uh, Assemblywoman Hansen in opposition. The measure does pass. Uh, we'll move on to item number nine for the record young students with the research division of the lcb um uh, f9 was is to draft a position statement in the committee's final report expressing support for the concept of smart from the start planning to encourage renewable energy development on already disturbed lands this recommendation was based on um, a presentation from the nature conservancy on june 16th and it's a sponsor of the committee solicitation recommendations in addition to that we heard uh, public comment at the beginning of this uh, meeting and have a document on the website. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Stanisbeck. And I just would again note that uh, it's a bit, uh, there's a bit more detail to this as was noted in the comments by the Nature Conservancy that it's not only, you know, this is not saying uh, no to any renewable energy development. It's um, you know, just looking to uh, find ways that we can prioritize that development in a, in a way that um, kind of minimizes conflicts and maximizes benefits. Um, you know, uh, whether that's using uh, already disturbed lands, identifying um, some corridors or degraded areas, and then, and again, just really trying to um, have a have a little bit more comprehensive plan. And I believe there's also now, which is a recurring theme, uh, some additional um, federal monies that are uh, or, or federal incentives that are available. Uh, to try and uh, prioritize uh, some of these projects. So uh, with that, we'd open it up to questions or comments from members. All right, uh, seeing none, um, uh, I, do, I, I did hear that there was a request that there also be a letter sent to the Department of Interior supporting uh, kind of more comprehensive uh, energy planning. Um, so uh, I'd be willing to take a motion to approve item F9 um, with the inclusion of a letter to the Department of the Interior along to the same effect. So moved. We have a motion from Assemblywoman Carlton, a uh, second from Vice Chair Donate. Discussion on the motion. Okay, seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Okay, seeing no nays, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, with that, we'll move on to item number F10. For the record, I'm sitting with the Research Division of the LCB. F10 is to draft the posi position statement in the committee's final report expressing support for adequate funding for the Division of Water Resources to update its data collection efforts, studies of water basins, and um, education of water rights. Uh, this again was um, um, based on uh, comments by the Nature Conservancy. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Stanisbeck. Um, just a couple quick notes on this. One is that this was um, a suggestion that was repeated time and time again from uh, a broad number of stakeholders uh, wanting to make sure that um, that the agency can uh, can carry out its responsibilities in managing our scarce water resources. Um, I also, just want to note uh, kind of the respect for the boundaries of this committee, and so um, you know, without uh, you know, taking extremely specific direction, just uh, noting that we generally support um, the funding for the agency uh, to undertake uh, these duties. Um, and, and, you know, appreciate some of the, the comments that have already been brought up around um, staffing and other things. Um, it comes to this as it does to, to any issue with our, with our state agencies at the moment. So is there any other questions or comments from our members? Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, if I could ask, so the position statement will be a final report. 
Is that going to go to Ways and Means? Is it going to go to the administration for the budget? How, who, mm -hmm. who are you going to send it to? Thank you for that, that question, Assemblywoman. So as a position or policy statement, this would just be included in the final um, report from the committee. Uh, it would not specifically be forwarded to any entity, but um, for anyone who's curious about what we came up with and what we support, they can pull the, this report and see that, that we express support for it. Thank you. I'm sure the future chair of Ways and Means will, will be very happy not to receive one letter because I can tell you the stack on my kitchen table before the beginning of session was very tall. So we appreciate not getting one of these letters. Absolutely. And much. I know that that committee sends quite a bit of letters of its own. So to, to limit the back and forth correspondence, I think, would be beneficial. Uh, any other uh, questions or comments on this item? I believe uh, Assemblyman Ellison. No, sir. I'm fine. Oh, all right. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Seeing none, I would uh, accept a motion to approve item F10. So moved. I have a motion from Assemblywoman Carlton, a second from Vice Chair Donate. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Nay. Okay, seeing none, that motion passes unanimously. That brings us to the last item on our work session document, item G11. For record, again, Shin Inspect with the Research Division of the LCB, uh, G11 is to request the drafting of a bill to adjust state agency employment standards to help tribal members obtain state employment. Additionally, this bill would make various changes related to the position of tribal liaison and would establish the qualification and experiences required by a person to be such, uh, to obtain such a position. It was uh, recommended by Ms. McDade, Willi Ms. McDade Williams during um, or out of discussions and presentations from the June 16th meeting. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Stenisbeck. Um, you know, I appreciate some of the public comments that were made on this. I know that this was something that I, I heard a lot of broad general support for. I think we don't know exactly what that language looks like that will help facilitate this, but um, uh, we hope to start figuring that out and then get it vetted through the full legislature. So I think definitely wanting to balance making sure that we have, um, you know, experienced folks in some of these positions but also wanting to make sure that we take a step back, um, talk with our, our uh, tribal governments and communities to identify what barriers there are and see if we can come up with some solutions that help uh, lower those so that, uh, so that we can create those opportunities for folks to work uh, in state government and that the, the tribal liaison positions um, that do exist, that they are, they're really serving that purpose and helping uh, be a bridge between uh, the state of Nevada and those tribal governments. So uh, I'll open it up to any uh, questions or comments from members. Assemblywoman Carlton. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I think this is an excellent idea, and I hope it's a first step towards being able to bring more folks into state government. We have talked so much about how we're having a hard time getting folks, and you know, it's it's not just the pay and the benefits. A lot of times, there's, there's a lot of barriers in order to be to be able to work for the state. They'll put in a certain level of college or whatever. Sometimes people have life experiences of, you know, a decade and would be perfect for the job, but because they can't check that one box, we're losing a lot of, you know, valuable Nevada experience from folks. So I think this is an excellent starting point to have that conversation and I hope you guys continue the conversation moving forward because I believe there's a lot of good folks out there in Nevada that would like to work for the state but because they don't have that master's degree or there's there's that one box they can't check um, we're doing a lot to get folks in and I think this is an excellent starting point so thank you very much for addressing this. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I too am optimistic that both this and the subcommittee's recommendation with relation to the uh, uh, kind of natural resources conservation core um, can really help help us uh, take those those considerations to the next level. Senator Gorkachia, I believe you had a question or comment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. But a lot of it was uh, 
answered by Miss Carlton's response. But I, you know, and I definitely agree that uh, I, I was just wanted to make sure that we were talking about all state positions and not just a tribal liaison position. So, uh, thank you. Thank you. And just to may I make sure the record is clear, that is correct. That's the intention. Anything else? All right. Seeing none, then, I would accept a motion to approve item 11. So I have a motion from Assemblywoman Carlton. I have a second from Vice Chair Donate. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Seeing none, that motion uh, passes unanimously. All right. Uh, thank you very much, members. That concludes our work session uh, document and, and action items for this committee. Um, we are going to go into public comment, so I would just like to make sure that everyone both down here in Las Vegas and Carson City is aware. Folks can be already begin coming up to the dais, but before we officially move to that item, Again, we'd just like to thank all of the members um, uh, of the committee, as well as the alternates who were able to, to come today for their hard work and their service. Uh, appreciate the, uh, the discussion uh, and, and the broad support that uh, we were able to find um, on so many of these action items. Um, uh, again, I believe it is a testament to, to the legislative process itself. So um, thank you all for that. With that, uh, we'll uh, move on to the last item on our agenda, which is public comment. So uh, we'll go ahead and begin um, down here in Las Vegas, then we'll go to Carson City, and then we'll go to the phones. So um, again, uh, we ask that folks limit their comments to three minutes. Uh, please uh, state and spell your name for the record. Whenever you're ready, you may begin. And please uh, hit the microphone button. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Dr. Kamut Acharya, president of the Desert Research Institute. I'd like to thank the committee for the support today for funding for DRI. State funding uh, is important for us as it helps us to reinvest in our research labs and remain competitive. We are grateful for the support of this committee as we seek an opportunity to return to how DRI is, uh, has been funded in the past and to allow us to continue to serve the state. I also want to reiterate that uh, the work that DRI scientists do, obviously uh, we support uh, different uh, problems and challenges in the state, including wildfire, uh, drought, uh, climate change. But I also want to make sure that uh, uh, I state this, that every we also provide economic benefit to the state. Every dollar DRI gets, we bring additional $4.82 to the state from outside agencies, and that obviously helps the economy here. And with that, thank you for your support. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Acharya. We appreciate you being here today. Um, seeing no one else in Las Vegas, uh, well, does anyone wish to provide public comment in Carson City? Last call. Doesn't I believe like Mr. It. Ellison would like to make a comment if he could. From go ahead, go ahead, Mr. Ellison. You can make a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I know that uh, this is off the budget, but uh, on the budget. I hope this is considered a ways and means. Right now, we're losing a lot of health workers that uh, helping our seniors. Uh, and the salaries that they're making, that they can't get anybody. And we're seeing uh, some of the seniors and, and handicap and, and mentally people right now that are, are, they just can't find people to work at the salaries they're getting. So Maggie, I'm hoping you can jump in on this, but uh, we're getting a lot of calls from down here you can't get a health worker at fourteen dollars an hour to go in when they can go to McDonald's and make sixteen or fifteen. You know, so we really need to look at uh, this situation because it's getting worse by the day, and we can't get help. So, uh, Maggie, you're probably an expert in this, but we've got to address the salaries and the health workers. Or if not, we're, we're going to see these people die at home. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Allison. Uh, with that, anyone else in Carson City wishing to make public comments? All right, seeing none, uh, 
we'll go to broadcast production services to see if we have anyone wishing to provide public comment by phone. To participate in public comment, please press star nine on your phone to take your place in the queue or the raise hand function on your Zoom window. Caller with the last three digits 101, please press star six to unmute. Caller, I see that you raised and lowered your hand. You need to press star six to unmute in order to provide. Uh, there you are, you're unmuted, you may begin. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Watts, members of the committee for the record. This is Scott Carey. I'm the state lands planner with the Nevada Division of State Lands. Uh, I was listening to the meeting today um, uh, concerning item E6 about the heat mitigation strategies and, and the master plans. Um, just wanted to throw out there for the committee and, and the staff for the future draft of this um, BDR, um, NRS 278-160, that, that's the section of NRS that provides the different elements of it that go into a master plan. And there's several instances where there is a population difference between what's, what, what sort of elements are required based on population. Um, one example of that is um, underground utility plans. Um, NRS requires an underground utility plan to be incorporated into a local government master plan in Clark and Washoe County, but not um, other counties less than 100,000. Um, another example of that was happened in this last session was um, SB 150, and that was that was a requirement added into NRS regarding tiny homes. And there were different provisions in that um, statute, but based on um, population, and there were different requirements for counties over 700,000, counties over 100,000, and counties less than 100,000. So, just wanted to throw that that information out there, helpful to the staff and, and the committee. If uh, we in the state land use planning agency can be of assistance. And drafting this bill, um, please, please let us know. Thank you, Chair Watts. Thank you for tuning in and uh, for the comments and the offer. I'm sure we'll be taking you up on it. Uh, with that, we'll move on to the next person wishing to provide public comment. Chair, the public line is open and working, and there are no more callers wishing to participate. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so, members, this concludes our business for uh, this interim. Um, I will note for all uh, members, we did order lunch, and because uh, we were so effective in our time, it's a grab and go instead of a break and return. Um, so, for for uh, folks in Carson City and Las Vegas, that is available. Uh, again, uh, just really appreciate uh, everyone's uh, engagement during this interim and look forward to working with most of you uh, and, and during the next session. And for those that aren't coming back, I will just take one more moment to thank you again for all your years of service to the state. Uh, with that, we are adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great job. Appreciate it.